Jake here. Thank you for taking a trip to the past with me. The original podcast version of The Americans will be released weekly, but if you don't want to wait, then go to jakebible.substack.com and become a paid subscriber. You'll receive access to all of The Americans as well as early release novels, audiobooks, and other exclusive extras. That's jakebible.substack.com. Now enjoy the original podcast production of The Americans. Cheers. Warning. This podcast reading is for mature audiences only. You will not be warned again. Welcome to the podcast reading of Jake Bible's The Americans, book two in the Dead Mech Apex Trilogy. The Americans is a side quill to Dead Mech, meaning it takes place simultaneously with book one. You can listen to this novel first or start with Dead Mech. Go to jakebible.com for more information on this podcast, Dead Mech, and other fiction by Jake Bible. Enjoy. Hey, welcome back to the Americans, everybody. And very fitting, considering it is 4th of July weekend. Yeah, America, fuck yeah. That's right, celebrating some independence. (sighs) You know, the Americans in my story have had a very hard time. And it's just going to get harder for them. Harder and bloodier and deadlier and gorier and scarier and other errs. Yeah. But you're just going to have to listen to this episode first and then the rest of the episodes before you find out just how err it gets. Hey, I'm not going to take up much time. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Hey, be sure and go to jakebible.com. Check that by the fiction, by the fiction page. It's it's in the title, folks, by the fiction. If you haven't gotten your copy of Dead Mech, go for it. You're going to want to read that puppy because you want to be up. Even if you have listened to the podcast, read the book. Come on now. You get a little better sense of what's going on when you read it. You can get distracted when you're listening. But when you're reading, you're in there. You're in the story. You're in the characters. You are the characters. And then, yeah, there's some Bethany in the Zombie Jesus. Some 31 Days of Halloween. I'm going to be getting C-Notes up soon. That's a collection of all my Friday Night Drabble Party free drabbles, all put together in one handy-dandy ebook. Won't that be cool? Uh, expect that in the next few weeks. Oh, I don't know exactly when, but it'll be at some point in the summer. I'll be sure and let you know. You know I will. And that's about it. I hope everyone who's you know in the U.S. of A. has a good 4th of July weekend. And everybody else who isn't in the U.S. of A. and not celebrating the American Independence Day, just have a good normal weekend. Um, I guess when you're listening to this, the weekend's almost over. Or maybe when you're listening to this, the weekend has ended because it could be in the middle of the night if you're in Europe or someplace else. But hey, I hope your weekend was good. I truly, truly do. All right, that's enough rambly dambly. And um, yeah, cheers, y'all. Thanks again. Enjoy. Chapter 22 Empress Natalia struggled to activate the shop's security hollows from her private rooms, but the system wasn't responding. Frustrated, she tried her comm several times, hoping to reach the Zverev, but to no avail. Incompetent fools! She screamed, storming from her private wing and towards the exit leading to the shop. I'll have them all boiled in their own excrement for not responding to me. In minutes, she made it to the door, threw it open, and froze instantly. She watched flames licking the sky, spouting from the entrance and roof of the shop. She could see guards running about, trying to put out the fires. But there were other guards, guards not quite right, that seemed to be attacking the ones coming to help. Screams and blood-curdling cries filled the air. What's going on? she shouted at them all. I command all of you to stop immediately. Get control of yourselves. From out of a cloud of smoke, Zverev stumbled and staggered, and the Empress stomped towards her head of security. Zverev, what in God's name is happening here? Have you lost your mind? Get these idiots in line and put out those fires. Now is not the... She trailed off as Zverev got closer, 
His face was ravaged, strips of flesh hanging like string. His entire uniform was coated in red, black, sticky blood, and his throat was nothing but a gaping hole. The Empress covered her mouth and backed away. Zverev, what's happened to you? Zverev! She began to panic when, instead of responding, Zverev bared his blood-stained teeth and roared, breaking into a run, hands with half-eaten fingers extended towards her. Empress Natalia Tartaroff felt the cold metal of the palace door behind her, but that was the last thing she did feel before Zverev pounced on her, his teeth ripping into her soft shoulder, tearing a massive chunk away, spitting it out and going back for the throat. Blood gushed and spurted, soaking her regal dress as she feebly beat at Zverev until the life left her and her arms went limp. Once the body cooled, Zverev lost interest, shoving away from the corpse and looking into the haze of smoke, trying to locate a new victim, a new meal. He rushed away, his undead legs leaping over rubble and other creatures feeding, his ears and nose leading him to a group of living guards that were surrounded and hopelessly outnumbered. While the screams of the living were choked off, the Empress Natalia's corpse lay glassy-eyed on the ground, shreds of flesh scattered everywhere. Minutes ticked by, the last few cries for help dying out. Then Natalia's body twitched, and her jaw clacked open and closed repeatedly until she sat bolt upright the sound of pure hunger, rage, and death shrieking impossibly from her open throat and swollen, cold lips. Well, that wasn't what we had planned, but it'll do nicely, Mr. Brown Eyes said, watching the hacked security hollows from the safety of the Three's HAV as it sped away from the overtaken palace. Yes, we can work with this, Mr. Plain agreed. Has Miss Isley responded yet? Yes, Mr. Continental answered. She has the first wave of troops ready for deployment. They can be here within 24 hours and, if all goes well, to the Chinese border in another 24. Then tell her to deploy them, Mr. Brown Eyes said. Let's get the ball rolling, shall we? No need to wait any longer. What about the special project she was working on? Mr. Plain asked. Mr. Stone? He is ready as well, Mr. Continental smiled. His modifications seem to be in perfect order. Excellent. Will he be joining the troops? Mr. Plain asked. Yes, Mr. Continental answered. This will be the true test of his new skills. If he can secede here, then taking on the jacks will be nothing for him or others. The three grinned at each other, satisfaction dripping from their smiles. Each turned back to the hollows and watched the dead creatures move from squirming body to squirming body, desperate to fill their hunger for flesh. Billy stared into the bloodshot and insane eyes of Heather Walton, and his breath caught in his throat. She's dead. Trust us, Melissa said. She was dead when we found her. But, but... B uh, Billy stuttered. We don't know what happened to her, Bess said. The doctor that was torturing her seemed caught off guard that she had come back, although he wasn't too surprised. What do you mean? Alex asked weakly, leaning against the door jam of the cargo hold. He knew this would happen? No, Melissa replied. He, he had seen this before, but was shocked it was happening to Heather. Melissa began to strip off her gore-matted suit, stepping out of the B.C. outfit, not caring as both Billy and Alex turned away from her naked body. Don't touch my suit. I haven't figured out how to clean it yet. Where's the fucking shower on this thing? Back of the cabin, Alex answered. Full shower with everything you'll need to scrub clean. Melissa stopped, her soot-covered face right in Alex's. Nothing will scrub me clean of this. Nothing. She walked off towards the stairs leading up to the main passenger cabin and both men turned to Beth. What the fuck happened in there? Billy asked. Are you all right? You're, you're bleeding? Alex asked right after. Beth didn't answer. Her attention focused on the struggling Heather. That, that will hold her for as long as it takes to get us where we're going, Beth said, acting as if no one had spoken. Beth, Alex asked warmly, what happened in the shop? The girl slowly turned towards Alex, her face a mixture of shock and fear. I don't know, she answered quietly, looking back at Heather. But I know what hell will be like if I'm doomed to her fate. 
She stepped back from the cage and looked each man in the eye briefly, before walking away after Melissa, leaving a trail of her own torn and soiled clothes. Burn those, please, she called back when she was halfway up the stairs. Billy just stood there while Alex leaned, both stunned, not sure if they should go after the girls or stay and watch the creature that used to be Heather Walton. For a brief moment, Mr. Stone believed his entire body was on fire. But as soon as his eyes opened, the sensation went away, and he wondered if he had dreamed it. But then he saw where he was, and the wires connected to his body, and knew it wasn't a dream. Mr. Stone, Miss Isley said, leaning over the exam table he was on, welcome back to consciousness. How do you feel? He tried to speak, but all that came out was a harsh rasp. My apologies, Miss Isley said. I'll have a technician fetch you some water. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, if that is okay. You'll just need to nod your head, all right? Mr. Stone did just that. Nod his head. Wonderful. First question, do you know who you are? Mr. Stone nodded. Excellent. Can you feel your fingers? Mr. Stone nodded and wiggled the fingers on both hands. Fantastic. How about your toes? Same result. Now, can you roll your head fully to the side? Great. How about the other side? Fine, just fine. Any pain? No. Excellent. Ah, here's your water. Miss Isley took the cup of water from the technician and helped Mr. Stone sit upright to take a sip. He felt a bit lightheaded, but it soon passed. Mr. Stone studied his surroundings carefully as he took many slow sips. He was in a small room, pure white walls, with zero equipment to speak of except for the table he was on. The wires attached to him fell to a hole in the floor and disappeared from there. As far as he could tell, there wasn't a door. Thanks, he croaked. Of course, Mr. Stone, Miss Isley smiled. Now I do have some unfortunate news. Mr. Stone narrowed his eyes and Miss Isley laughed. Nothing horrible, I assure you. It is just that the training we'd hoped to give you will have to be uploaded directly. While this saves time and we have found only decreases efficiency by about 15%, it can be a mite uncomfortable. Upload? Mr. Stone asked. Upload what? Your training, Mr. Stone. Like I said, you don't expect to just be able to magically know how to use your new gifts, do you? Gifts? What have you done to me? Memories of the past couple days began to filter back through his brain, the image of Reginald being killed the most predominant. Who are you? I am your new boss, Mr. Stone, and any other questions will be answered by the upload. Miss Isley replied, a mind spike in her hand. She set the spike into a waiting receptacle on the table, and several small lights began to blink. So, let's begin. Oh, and don't worry, you won't be alone. Miss Isley clapped her hands, and Mr. Stone's world went black. I can't see, he exclaimed. Yes, we can't have any external stimulus getting in the way of the upload. With that, Mr. Stone lost his sense of hearing, smell, touch. He was just a mind floating in nothingness, until the excruciating pain slammed into his brain. Pain and a voice. That was pretty incredible back there, Melissa said as she toweled off while Beth stepped into the small shower stall. I don't know what kicked your ass into gear, but you've got some crazy new skills. Thanks, Beth said. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't get to Heather sooner. Well, I'm just praying there's a way to reverse the effect, Melissa said, although the tone of her voice revealed she had zero hope of that happening. Yeah, me too. Beth replied. Melissa tossed the towel aside and grabbed a robe hang hanging from the wall. While we we're on the subject of back there, do you mind telling me why you fucked that guard? Beth was quiet for a moment. It wasn't me. Right, um, we both know that isn't true, Melissa laughed, and pretty sure you got the sore cooch to prove it. No, what I mean is, while it was me doing it, it wasn't me doing it. I... I I know it doesn't make sense, but it wasn't... It was the same feeling I've had off and on for a long time. Well, as long as I can remember. It's like I step out of my body, but I don't really leave. Yeah, that, that makes absolutely zero sense. I know. That's the problem. Well, better hope that guy didn't have the bloody tips or anything. He'll be pissing pus for a week if he did. Beth turned the water off and Melissa handed her a dry towel. 
I don't think I get sick. You don't think... What? I don't think I get sick. I, I don't feel like I do, at least. Well, how the fuck would you even know that? Why? Does that sound weird? Weirder than me fucking some strange guy in a prison cell? Good point, uh, freak. Melissa handed Beth a robe and pushed her onto a small bench. Hold still. I'm going to stitch up that ear, otherwise it'll never stop bleeding. The girls smiled at each other and Beth held still while Melissa worked. Go lie down, Alex, Billy said. You've probably undone half the bullshit job I did on your wounds. Alex, visibly shaken and exhausted, began to protest but quickly decided not to. Thanks. Let me know if she, well, changes. You mean if she stops snarling and foaming at the mouth? Right. I'll see if I can get more information from the girls. Rest first, then let them rest too, Billy insisted. Stiles says we're an hour from the border, Alex said, so we have that long to catch a little nap before things get tough. Tough? How? Heather was the one with the code to get us through the Chinese shields. She isn't really in any position to help now, so we have to do it the hard way. Which is? Up and over. It'll suck, but I've done it before and we'll be fine. Billy nodded towards the stairs. Good. Go rest. Will do. Mr. Gines surveyed the battalions that stepped onto the transport ship. Is he ready? He asked Miss Isley as she approached the rail. He will be by the time we get there, she answered. He's disoriented, understandable, since he had just had several weeks' worth of information inserted into his mind in the space of minutes. She grinned. You're right about him, Mr. Guy. Any other person would be brain-dead from that experience, but he isn't. Remarkable. He's always been the best. I wish you hadn't killed Reginald. He would have been a good asset also. Hardly, Miss Isley replied. We dissected his brain. He didn't have anywhere near the capacity as Stone does. He would have broken quickly. But he isn't lost, Mr. Gein. Gein eyed Miss Isley carefully. What have you done? Simple. I kept the partnership together. I uploaded Reginald's psyche into Mr. Stone's mind. It'll be as if he's sitting right next to him. You what? <laughs> Never mind. I'm, I'm sure you know what you're doing. Mr. Gein responded, shaking his head and pinching the bridge of his nose as the ship's departure whistle blew. You sure the conditioning will hold out? On Stone? Nothing is for certain with Mr. Stone. On the rest? Yes, of course. The hollows the three sent us were invaluable. We modified the programming slightly, and even in death we'll be able to control them all now. Even in death, Mr. Gein whispered. We're back full circle. Hundreds of years later, we're playing with the same fire. No, Mr. Gein, not the same fire, better fire. But we won't lose control like the Americans did. Mr. Gein studied Miss Isley's face for a moment, then shook his head again. Don't be so sure, Miss Isley. Greater men and women than us have said the same thing and paid the price for those words. <laughs> been listening to the podcast reading of Jake Bible's The Americans. This novel and recording are protected under whatever latest greatest Creative Commons license is out there currently. Share this all you want. Just don't even try to make a buck off it without the express permission of the author, me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, please go to jakebible.com. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the re-release of the original podcast production of The Americans. Don't want to wait each week for a new episode? Go to jakebible.substack.com and become a paid subscriber. Want more audiobooks? Go to jakebible.com for info and access to dozens of Jake Bible fiction audiobooks and ebooks. Cheers.